Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Friday, August 12th. We are here live. We're going to open the phone lines right now. It is time for trucking technology and efficiency. Trucking efficiency and technology. We're going to talk about trucks or whatever you want to talk about today because it's also a freaky free-for-all Friday. Uh, I think both John and Joel are joining me. I don't see them on the board yet. Oh, no, there they are. Uh, Oh, I see why I don't see them. So uh, I had a couple things, but I'm just going to bring them in. Oh, I'm going to warn you right now. If you want to get in with a call, we're only doing one hour today, right at one hour. If we've got calls in the line, I'm cutting them off. I've got uh, I've got to get up north uh, to Bellingham for a wedding. My son Michael's getting married this weekend, and... Uh, Lisa and I spent all day yesterday getting ready. Uh, You know, I took a trip in the coach, a long trip, and when I brought it back, I just kind of parked it there, really didn't do a whole lot to it. Then Lisa took a trip in hers, kind of did the same thing, so now we're paying for it. We're trying to get them ready to go. Um, I also think once once we're done, I really love that area up there. I think we're going to hang out around Anacortes and maybe go explore the islands next week. I'm still going to be working. I'll do the show from the road next week. But I think we're going to take a little time off, have a little fun after the wedding. But um, yesterday we ended up with like 18,000 steps. It was one of those days. So uh, I'm a little tired. I'm going to let uh, John and Joel take over for a bit here. John, looks like you're first up, and we haven't heard from you for a couple weeks, so welcome back. Oh, glad to be here, Kevin. I've been uh, just crazy busy. Um, That's awesome. More stuff being thrown at me than ever, yeah. Good. I, in good. a good way. Yeah, yeah. It is awesome. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm like, pinching myself. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, that's awesome. It's that 25-year 20, overnight success thing, you know, <laughs> that right. uh, people <laughs> think, oh, this guy. <laughs> so, yeah. I've been at this for a long time, and it's like, you know, the vibe I'm getting is a finally, or maybe I was always a little insecure about it, or just maybe too humble, whatever. But, I mean, I, I feel like I'm getting a whole lot of respect in the motorsport world now, and I've got uh, yeah, it's 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 just it's 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 good, really good. I'm fantastic. I'm, I'm in a really good spot right now. Fantastic. That said, I've been so busy. I've not kept up on shows. I've not kept up on what's going on. I've been with little bits and pieces of all of Joel's post things that I seem to always catch, but that's about it. Um, I hear I missed something really funny on Tuesday's show at the end that I didn't go back and listen to. But uh, you know, maybe someone can fill me in on that. What? But what was uh, it? yeah, it's. I don't know. I, I just saw something on Facebook. I don't. I guess you said something funny or something funny happened at the end of the show. Ryan Bechtel posted something. Let me go back and listen to it. And I haven't had a chance. Oh, so, okay. But, uh, I wonder what it was. I don't remember what yeah. it was now. Maybe I'll have to go look. Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> maybe Brian, maybe so, Ryan could chime in and tell us about it. So, yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, you know, kind of seeing where you are and, you know, with your business kind of taken off. And have you ever read the book, uh, The Millionaire Next Door? No, but it's on my list. Uh, you're, you're like the second or third person to recommend that one to me. Yeah, it's been around a long time. There's some really good lessons in there, but it, it's more of you just kind of see this trend, and it certainly happened with me. Um, sound like you're kind of moving into that phase. He, he talks about these people who are primarily self-employed for the most part. You know, there might be like contractors, people in the trades, uh, small business owners, things like that. That's primarily where we get our, you know, self-made millionaires. Certainly enough people, you know, might go to Stanford or MIT and end up with a corporate job and become a millionaire. But for the most part, it, it's kind of small, self-employed trades people, things like that. But he talks about the fact that you know, it's not the people you might think. It's not usually the people in gated communities with, you know, two high-end cars. And those people are usually mortgaged to the hilt um, and, and 
I, I know a lot of people don't realize it, but even people with a lot of money sometimes live paycheck to paycheck and month to month. Uh, and, he, and he talks about it <laughs> yeah. in that book. And then he talks about, you just never know, the guy next door, it could be a millionaire and you would never know it because they don't live like one. They don't, you know, it's not flashy. It's not spending a lot of money. It's, you know, years of, you know, good financial stewardship and good habits. And then over time, you know, you get better and better. And he really talks about the trend is that most people who, whether it's, you know, becoming a millionaire or just becoming financially independent, our best decade is our 50s. That's when you're, you're really going to probably accomplish the most. That's, that's kind of the trend. I'm kind of feeling that. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I'm 55. Uh, I, I'd like to think I'm a young 55, I, you know, thanks to, thanks to you, uh, and things that I've learned from you, I'm not, I not got turned on to the diet stuff and so forth. Um, you know, I mean, you know, my numbers are all good. I, I don't have joint issues. I, I feel better. I actually feel better than I did when I was in my forties, to be honest with you, I, physically and, and mentally, I mean, I'm sharper. Yeah. Every, everything. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, and, and I haven't been super strict about the diet, but enough. Like, like if you change the base, if you, you, you change your right. lifestyle, if, yeah. uh, your go-tos, if, you, if your go-tos are no longer a sandwich or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, right. Pizza you know, a hunk of meat or, you know, or, yeah. or some, you got it. Yeah. 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 So, it, it, and that doesn't, you know, so I don't think you have to be super strict with it, but I do feel better when I am, to be honest with you. Uh, but it's nothing like I felt before. I mean, it's, you know, just, just that's life changing. So couple that with, you know, the things starting to happen business wise. And, and, and I get you, I'm, I'm not that, I'm not that millionaire next door guy. I'm, I've been sort of the opposite of that. I mean, my financial stewardship has been more of a, you know, it's just, just figure it out. I'll make more money, you know, for a bankruptcy type, uh, you know, make sure the kids have everything I want them right. to have. And, you know, they're getting, getting through all their stuff. And, you know, I, I set a standard and then I figured out how to pay for it. But that said, uh, you know, I'm not going to be one of those mortgages that help uh, millionaires. If I get to that point, it's because I can't be, which is not, you know, not necessarily a bad, bad place to be, to be honest with you. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't mind earning my way in and, and working my ass off. And, you know, like I said, it's just, it, it just, it feels like I'm like, holy crap, it's starting to work out. I always believed that if I did something I loved and worked hard at it, the financial one might take care of itself. I know that's kind of cliche, yep. but uh, it sort of is. It, it's cliche so, yeah. for a reason, though. You know, we, we have cliches and stereotypes yeah. for reasons. So, yeah, it, it, <laughs> you know, and, and I remember reading the book. I was probably 30 when I read it. It's been around a long time. Uh, and, you know, I kind of saw this whole decade of the 50s certainly been my best. And the other thing you mentioned, I started making the dietary changes just about the time I turned 50. So it's really been kind of a pretty good decade for me. I tell people all the time, you said you feel better than you did in your 40s. Sometimes I say I feel better than I did in my 20s. I had lots of joint pain in my 20s. I was diagnosed with arthritis in my 20s. And I don't have any of that stuff. My digestion was a disaster most of my life. That's all gone. So in a lot of ways, you know, you don't have that, you know, really youthful, you know, energy kind of thing. But I have crazy amounts of energy. Like I said, yesterday, 18,000 steps. We were at it all day. Uh, the only reason I really quit last night was because it got dark and my pressure washer <laughs> ran out of gas. So <laughs> I figured it was probably time to quit. Um, so, oh, hey, I just got a, I just got a message from Angie about uh, the funny thing that happened on at the end of the show on Tuesday. I told the story about the signature truck and the FAS system, how it saved me from embarrassment because I literally 
on the way back. We we built that truck. We finished it, and we didn't even really finish it. We some of the stuff that was on the truck wasn't hooked up yet. It was just on there, so you could see right. it. Um, we kind of sort of finished it around you know eleven o'clock at night the night before down in Tennessee, and then Lisa and I drove up to Louisville for the show. Then we did the show for three days, and we were just wiped out. And we got in the truck, and I had parked on a slope sideways. So when I got in the truck and looked at the fuel gauge, I had, you know, somewhere between half and or quarter and a half. And I'm thinking, you know, later today, I need to think about getting some fuel. And then later on in the day, I'm driving, and I'm watching all kinds of gauges, you know, because I'm so interested in this truck. I've never really driven it much. And I looked down, my fuel gauge is under empty. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> I had been sitting on that angle, I know so all happened. the fuel went into the tank with the... So I'm like, oh my God, I got to stop. So, and then dummy me, I asked Lisa, I said, check for the next fuel stop. I got to stop. And she says, okay, coming up at this exit, there's a fuel stop. And then I remembered, oh, I want to weigh this truck. We've never weighed it. So I said, does that truck stop have a scale? She looks and she said, no. And I said, see if you can find one with a scale. And she said, there's one, but it's the next exit after that. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can make it. It started stalling as I was getting off the ramp. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm wiggling the steering wheel, trying to slosh the fuel around. And I blew right through the stop sign at the end of the ramp. I, there was no way I was going to stop. I, Might not start again. Yeah, I, Right. It, it stalled and I coasted to a stop at the pump. Oh, perfect. I, it was, a, a, but it was, it had completely stalled. I mean, I was doing everything I could to keep it running. So now I'm thinking, boy, this thing, you know how it can, they can be hard to start after you do that. So I park at the fuel island and I'm thinking, all right, I'll put fuel in this thing. I'm probably going to have to fight with it to start. But of course, somebody recognizes me. I hear, Kevin, is that you? Is that the signature truck? And the next day, I know I've got like 15 people standing around talking about the truck. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to try starting this thing right now. And now it's not going to start. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sweating bullets like, you know, what am I going to do? I, I, if I stand here, there's no way they're leaving. Right. I mean, nobody, they're just not all going to walk away. So then I remembered the fast. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure if I just turn the key on, uh, it should pump enough fuel. It's started. fast run for a few minutes. Yeah. It started right up. So, yeah. but I'm pretty sure it was the fast that made it so easy to start. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It was, uh, you'd, you'd have been a long time with the gear pump trying to pull the, pull the fuel. Uh, the past just you know, pressurizes it basically, so it should have fired right up. Yep. Yeah, so that's what happened there. All right, uh, what else you got this week? Me, not a whole lot. Um, like I said, I've been I've been so up to uh, my elbows in work. I haven't paid attention to a whole lot. Uh, I'm here for questions and commentary and so forth. Uh, I, I've been working through that book that you uh, recommended. Uh, End of the world is just the beginning. Isn't that um, a crazy book? Probably about two thirds of the way through. I, I've, I've had so many of those thoughts in the past, and I just finished the chapter with uh, where he goes about the debasing uh, money, the money, you know, yeah. the, the getting rid of the gold standard, basically. And he doesn't get into a philosophy that I have. I, I, I don't want to say I'm, I'm a fan of crypto. Um, I am a fan of the blockchain, and it makes sense to me because it is based in something. It's based in processing power. That becomes the new gold standard, but at least it's based in something. Uh, a lot of people don't have a hard time uh, grasping that. And it, I think it's for that reason, unless we figure out some way to, to base money in something else again. I, I really think, you know, it might be 100 years down the road, but uh, I, I think that crypto is going to be here to stay. And I think it's we're, we're going to end up more that way, especially after, you know, the, the it, problems that the, the, the debasing money has caused. It, it certainly seems like and we yeah, don't even know it. Right. Yeah. That we will end up with some sort of electronic currency that that seems, you know, pretty uh, that's a safe bet. I think uh, it's going to take itself a long time to shake out. And that's but, the, yep. the you know, the book one, I was I, I love the way he completely kept politics out of it. 
you know, I politics gets yeah. wrapped up in everything, but I think he did an excellent job of it's not a political book at all. And I, I, he's just, he, I don't know, is he just that convincing? I, as I'm reading the book, I'm like, this is going to happen. And then after I put the book aside <laughs> and I had time to think about it, I'm like, that's kind of crazy. He's making a lot of wild assumptions, you know, that all of these things are going to lead to this and it's a pretty big thing he's talking about. Countries not trading anymore. I, I can't even imagine a world like that. Yeah, it's, I don't know that I agree with that. I really don't. I, that's quite an assumption in my opinion. It really is. And and I do see a leveling out. I do see, you know, globalization happen. You're not stopping it. It's not, you could, you could be as uh, whatever nationalistic as you want to. It's not, it's not going to go away. But, but, you know, like you and I both agree that like, Business will drive it. When it's cheaper to make stuff here, we're going to make stuff here. Um, yeah. You know, that's love or exactly hate this right. last bill that just passed, so there's going to be some actual incentives for that to actually start happening. You know, and again, if it makes business sense, if, if the corporations are getting the tax breaks or whatever incentives to start making shit here again, they will. And only if it's profitable, right? Only if it, if that's enough to make it profitable to not have it done overseas. Right. So we're going to see a cycle where that happens, for sure. You're seeing it now. Aside from public opinion, uh, you know, and, and then the emerging economies are always going to be there to compete with. I mean, you know, at some point China is going to want a real middle class and things are going to get expensive to make there. And then it's going to move on to India or wherever, you know, people are willing to work for cheap for a while. And eventually they become educated and want to make more money. And so I see a big leveling off, you know, I don't, and maybe no need to trade. Right. You're not going to need to do that. It's just not going to be necessary. Yeah. You know, it, again, it was such a, it, you know, I read a lot and that was such a new concept. Like you said, I kind of, I've had those thoughts over time, not, not to that extent. Um, so it was just, right. if nothing else, it was a really interesting read. I actually said that premise would make a really good novel, I think. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you could have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Do a, a, a semi, semi-fiction, uh, you know, it'd, it'd make a great movie. I <laughs> think so. Flash movie. Yeah. You could have some fun with it for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's, yep. uh, but, uh, let's, yeah. So I'm not done yet. So like I said, I just got, got past the money part. So we're going to, we're going <laughs> to move on from there. So I'm, I guess you, I'm a little past halfway. There you go. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's add Joel to the conversation. Joel, good morning. Hey guys. How you doing? Good. What's on your mind this morning? Oh, I've got all kinds of truck numbers that you'll probably be interested in. All right. Um, I don't know if you've been watching Henry Albert with his lift axle six by two, that freight liner rolled out I, and he is I kind of a, yeah, kind of a downsped configuration with an overdrive. Um, mm. and he runs an overdrive and he's in the high tens, low 11s, uh, a good deal of the time. Um, Jamie Hagen with a lift axle with an overdrive just ripped off a 632 mile run with 48,000 pounds in the trailer, average 63 mile an hour at 11.3 miles a gallon. Wow. <laughs> and that's a max. <laughs> These are yeah. just crazy He's a bad numbers. Ass. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you, awesome. you look at what what these new transmissions and the new downsped technology is doing, uh, you know, in my mind, there's only two downsped engines on the marketplace at the moment. And that's the, the D 13 TC and the DD 15, the rest of them in my mind, they're not truly downsped yet. And these seem to be the two dominant engines out there when it comes to fuel efficiency. Now we are learning that, we're getting some really crazy efficiency out of these transmissions and overdrive. So Freightliner is claiming, you know, less than 1% difference between overdrive and direct drive. Wow. And, you know, when you, when you look at the thermodynamic gain and the parasitic loss, you know, uh, via piston speed in the engine, you know, you drop 300 RPM, you're gaining, 4% efficiency. So running an overdrive with these newer transmissions, um, 
doesn't hurt a damn thing. In fact, it's a good thing. It's 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 a positive. It doesn't necessarily hold true with any of the older stuff, but right. this newer right. stuff. When they want to gear this stuff in overdrive, let them gear it in overdrive. Um, in fact, I think it's getting to the point where we're so efficient that. You know, everybody was on a direct drive kick there for a while in new trucks, and they were like, oh, it's the only way we're going to meet, you know, greenhouse gas emission regulations and stuff. I don't think that's any longer the case. Direct drive, when you spec a truck to run in direct drive, it is so limiting on your efficiency range. It's very, very narrow. It is efficient when you're in the range, but it's such a narrow range that it's it's really hard to deal with as a driver. And, and these new overdrive trucks, they just give you such a wide operating range and really can kick the speed up on them. And, and uh, we're seeing just some outstanding efficiency numbers. Um, for a direct comparison, and this one I just absolutely love. So I've got a guy that I'm working with in the Akron, Ohio area. He runs a dedicated turnout uh Portland, I believe, and then back to West Virginia and then back up to Akron. He's fairly light one way, heavy the other. He's been a Peterbilt guy his entire life. 500 Cummins, um, 13 speeds, 336s is, is his typical spec. And he just bought a new 6x2 Volvo iTorque with a 14 speed and the 2.16 reaxle ratio, turbo compounded. And just Forget about the fuel mileage and everything. We're just looking at his cost of fuel. And <laughs> he's looking in his Peterbilt at about 71 cents a mile. Ouch. And in his in his new Volvo, he's down to 50 cents a mile. Oh, so wow. he's 21, 21 cents better. Just, I mean, that, so- that stuff is very hard to ignore. And to, the, to that fact... I have just been flooded by guys that are either coming out of or want to get out of glider kits that have the Detroits and the, and the cats in them. You know, they're stuck in that six and a half to seven and a half mile a gallon range. They've tried everything to try to break out of that. They just can't do it. And I've, I've put five people into these I torque trucks now that have came out of situations like that. And they just are happy as can be, you know, they're in that eight and a half to nine mile a gallon range truck pulls better. It's faster. They're just absolutely thrilled. And I'm thinking we must be making some progress on the, the old school is cool mindset because I've actually had four or five, livestock, you know, bull haulers call me with the long stretched out peats. The one guy I talked to just this morning has an eight foot gap between the back of the cab and the front of the trailer. And I said, is there, is there a reason for that? And he says, what, besides it looks cool. And so I explained to him, you know, you're probably consuming an extra 45 horsepower at 70 mile an hour to run that eight foot gap going down the road. And so uh, he thinks he's okay with a shorter gap now. And I'm thinking, yeah, right on, man. So <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put a all together for him and see what we can do with it. That's a trunk trend that I don't get. I mean, to, to me, that is almost as bad as the Carolina squat. Like it, it is in, in the big roller yeah. skate wheels and tires on pickup trucks. I know. Uh, it, it's, I, I, I never liked it. It always looks stupid to me. I'm sorry. I hope I don't offend anybody, but it, it's just dumb. Like, I, I don't, I don't get it. Like it, it doesn't even look good. I, <laughs> so. I always thought the same thing. And look, I, when we talk about a classic long nose built, right. You know, it, it, they do look good. No doubt about it. But I have never liked that long stretch frame. I think it looks ridiculous. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. Uh, it creates a lot of other problems as well. It's, it's just not fuel efficiency, especially when you look at that pack car. They got such narrow frame rails; they're not very high, and you get that bounce so, in the frame rail. And I'm like, what the hell are they thinking? So when I when I did city work, P and D work, there were a couple occasions where people would show up someplace with one of these trucks and couldn't get the trailer into the dock. Just couldn't do it. There just physically wasn't enough room. It wasn't a matter of how good of a driver you were. If there isn't physically enough room because that damn tractor's so long, I had to put trailers in the docks every now and then for somebody. 
Yeah, I've, I've run into that on occasion as well. It's a, a quick way to make yourself an extra 20 bucks a lot of times. <laughs> Don't throw money at you. Put my trailer in the dock. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but put my trailer in the dock. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not even a matter so, yeah. of, of don't tell it. it. It wasn't their driving skill. I mean, if there isn't physically enough <laughs> no, right, room, right, just exactly. isn't enough room. Yeah. I don't care how good you are. That, that truck is not putting exactly. that trailer in that dock. It's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. It's so, hey, it's just not, my, my final, yeah. my, Oop, my yeah, final stuff I wanted to touch on real quick. And, and Kevin, I sent you this message and, and uh, it's about maintenance cost on new trucks. Oh, yeah. and, and I want to share some of the things that, that Ploger has done. And remember, Ploger is kind of transitioning from the smaller fleet into the bigger fleet where we can use economies of scale. And when you hear these numbers, you'll start to put together economies of scale and why they're important and why you don't see a lot of the very latest and greatest aerodynamic stuff hanging on trucks and maybe not low rolling resistance tires, which is kind of what you see on my brother's latest specs and they worked really hard on this and so maintenance costs you know they just get ridiculous and we've got our own shop and we work very hard to make that extremely efficient and being that we buy a whole lot of parts now we get a pretty nice break on parts and and uh you know the, the shop's very efficient and we got looking at the truck and you know the low rolling resistance tires they have a higher wear rate than than the moderate rolling resistance tires do and so you have labor and swapping things out and downtime and when you take all that into consideration i think what they've been able to do is just it's pretty astounding so right now we're running 70 power units and around 200 trailers that i think they own they release a few more but the owner owned ones i think they track the expenses on and for the entire fleet and this is going to include and a 20 something trucks with over 500,000 miles out to, I think there's a couple out there that have a million in the fleet. Um, our entire, everything in for the whole fleet is 14 cents a mile. That is. When we look at. Insanely yeah, that's, low. That's a great, uh, that is a great number. Yes. When we look at our, our newest turbo compounded engines that we have where we're running the 226 or the 216 ratios what Volvo's calling i torque nowadays we've had some of those in the fleet now for up to three years and when we look at just those trucks they're running at three cents a mile over three years on maintenance costs that's incredible so, so it, it, <laughs> extremely low Joel? extremely low yes Joel, it- and I realize some of yep. that comes from discounts and things like that, but that's not the bulk of keeping your cost down that low. The bulk of keeping your cost down that low is somebody is specking these trucks right, maintaining them right. Here's how extreme that number is. If I had a call from an owner operator today and they were going over their numbers and they told me their maintenance cost was three cents a mile, I'd be screaming at them, you're not doing something. This is this is going to come back no, to you yeah. because you are not yeah. doing something. You missed something, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Yes. No. 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 You're you're exactly right. But you, you it, it that the discounts on parts do do play a part. But you're right. It's the specking and the downsped part, and the piston speed that I'm always talking about. That you know, I know people probably get sick of hearing it, and it goes right over their head. But I mean, we just do not have emission system problems. You know, they're just not there. And it's not, it's, and it's, it's not because we have to treat anything or do anything like that. It is the, the mechanics of how things are working. And, and we've really thought it through and we've really worked with a lot of engineers on this and, um, they just have been stupendous for us. Let's think about this for a second. So there was a time and, and Joel, I know you've thought about this and you do some of this. There was a time when I, I started knowing that I could take virtually any truck and figure out a way to get better fuel economy out of it. And a mile per gallon was not out of the question at all. You know, I could look at most trucks on the road and Mm -hmm. say, yeah, we could improve that by a mile per gallon. And then you start doing the math and then you start thinking about fleets with a thousand trucks and the numbers get so big. You know, I had this idea where Mm -hmm. I was going to go out to the fleet. I would take all the risk 
you're not you don't have to pay me anything i'm going to come in i'm going to show you all this stuff i'm going to mm-hmm. do all this stuff and all i want is 10 percent of the savings and and we have to be able to prove that you actually received that savings and if you do then i just want 10 mm-hmm. percent of it and the numbers oh mm-hmm. my god i i i should be you know calling up bill gates right now to talk about farmland in north dakota or something if if the idea would have worked <laughs> right the potential right. was right. incredible but the diff and now right. i look back you know i opened the show today talking about that original signature truck and that truck had almost all the things we're talking about now except the true downspeed. we we weren't down speed mm-hmm. like that you, and you couldn't i mean that we understand why now but right. the one thing i took the most heat about on that truck was the six by two that lift axle people told me i was insane right. oh, this is a dumb idea it's, so we took a lot of heat over that but a lot of what that truck had is what you're talking about now it, the difference being that truck was the exact opposite of plug and play it wasn't driver friendly. That yes. truck was complicated. Right. And there was right. no way you were going to get fleets to build a truck like that. There was just no. And if they tried, yes. it would have been a horrible failure, would have been a disaster. So you're, you're right. You're you're exactly right on this. I mean, we we played with it as a fleet when we, just before we started transitioning into the into the economy of scale uh, model. And, and really, I mean, it's more today about human resources and managing people. It's not about the efficiency. And, you know, part of the reason I'm getting into my own thing now is, is because of that. I, I'm not into that part of it, but, but what you're saying is exactly right for a fleet. You have to spec the lowest common denominator and all of the things that you've done on that truck, no way in hell that would fly in a fleet. Even though the, the fuel efficiency numbers are stupendous, it's not going to, you'd roll that truck into the shop and all the mechanics would stand around looking at it and go, what the hell do we do? Well, you know, that's what would happen. It, it, a lift axle. What do we do with that? You know, so, and it, it would, it would get crazy. So yep. many things would go wrong. The simplest thing, you can't put a fleet air filter in a fleet truck. They'll lose them. No. They'll get thrown away. <laughs> They'll throw them away, the lose them. Yeah. They'll get They'll throw them away, yeah. stolen, yep. Uh, yep. whatever. It, that, something so simple, yep. it works, but it's not going to work at a fleet level. But here's the thing. You know, look at what we're facing in our country right now. And I don't want to get political with this, but it seems to me like Everything that we're struggling with, inflation, fuel cost, is intentional. They've told us it's intentional. They want to move us to an electric future. I get it. But I think they're doing it all wrong. I've said this from the beginning. If electric is going to work, let it work on its own. Do you realize they're in the the bill they're passing right now, there is a $40,000 credit to buy an electric truck? Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. And, and you know, I, I th- we should not be doing that. But I, let's, I, let's look at this instead. I get it. If we want to start making improvements in the environment and our use of fossil fuels, I get it. Let electric make its way into the equation on its own as it's cost effective. But look at what is possible if we took all of this stuff we talk about on the show and we were able to get fleets to buy and spec their trucks this way, and they can, these are plug and play trucks now. You can just buy this truck, throw any driver in it and do really well if you spec it right and do just a little bit of driver training, not much at all. And think about the number of trucks on the road, the number of miles they travel, and the potential on how much fuel we could save. It's I uh, 100% agree. Yes. Um, oh. Jamie Hagen's Little Fleet has done a spectacular job at integrating this type of technology into a fleet situation. Now, granted, smaller fleet, um, it's much more difficult on, a, say, a, a Schneider level, but it, it is doable. Um, you know, I think the government trying to ram some of this electric truck stuff down our throat is actually going to backfire it on is. them. As you watch these, these, these engines get more and more and more efficient pushing the boundaries because now guys are motivated to push the boundaries because they don't want to make the jump to electric. And now we're seeing 10 and a half and 11 mile a gallon diesel trucks. 
And when you use those numbers to compare to an electric truck, no way you can cost justify an electric truck when you're getting 11 no. miles a gallon with no. a diesel. Just, just not no. going to happen. Well, well, here's the other thing. And, and nobody... I, you're still going to have to explain to me. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, here's the other thing nobody's talking about with this electric. They are acting like you refuel an electric vehicle free. That, that nobody even bothered right. to talk about the cost of electricity. You know, when, when Buddha Judge says, just go buy an electric car. Well, wait a minute. First off, they're really expensive. They at least acknowledge that part of it, but they don't acknowledge. Has anybody even bothered to do the math today? Is electricity actually cheaper than diesel fuel? I'm not sure that it is. And if it is, it's not going to be for long because how does pricing work? I think it's called supply and demand. If we, <laughs> yes. if, if all of yes. a sudden we electrify <laughs> we will see it right now with, with fuel, right? The Kevin, cost of electricity Kevin, is, is, is going to go through the roof. And we're not even talking about some of the other costs to doing things like this. I, I, oh, here's the other one. Is, right now, we're not taxing electric vehicles. That's going to change. So the minute you start taxing them by the mile or whatever, you may not be able to afford to run these electric vehicles. So talk about what you what you just stated that, um, you know, what happens with prices, supply and demand with diesel fuel. And if we start to transition to electric, <laughs> then demand goes down. Exactly. This, is, this is exactly why the Biden administration, they don't want to drill here and they don't want to build new refineries. They want to keep that diesel fuel supply tight so they can make the argument to transition into electric. If we have plentiful diesel fuel, the second demand falls off, diesel fuel prices plummet. Yep. And if they plummet, they get cheap enough, you can't justify the electric. So this is why we get no pipeline. This is why we don't drill. This is why we don't build refineries. In order to make the case for electric, you cannot have a stable supply of diesel fuel around. Yeah, I, I just don't understand how we justify taking money from everybody in the country and giving people forty thousand dollar credits. That that's just wrong. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it is it is absolutely. It, yeah. And and who benefits from this? Elon Musk, the richest guy in the world. <laughs> Come on, right? right. It, it's, it's the rich people that are going to benefit from this all. It's not going to benefit me and you and an average show blow on the road. That's for sure. Elon, that is for sure. Elon Musk is. Uh, not I'm going to go back to talk. Elon Musk is not discounting his truck $40,000. That's not what's happening. He's getting paid full price for his truck, and the government's giving somebody the $40,000 that they took from us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's nuts. John? No, diesel agrees. Like, <laughs> uh, the, the whole electric truck thing again i don't mind as much and i think the market will take care of it eventually regardless of what the government does maybe i'm an optimist but you know when it makes sense and it will be supply and demand but it is just gonna be just as expensive to run one of those as is anything else what i don't get being skipped over here is any sort of hybrid uh, so our race cars the, the premier class in uh IMSA next year is switching to hybrid it's it's a spec system everybody has it but the cool stuff that it does would benefit a truck so well. I mean, given the ability to create your own electricity going down hills, uh, pulling away from stop signs. So our race car next year is going to leave the pits on the electric motor. It's going to come in. The engine shuts off on its own on its way in. When, when, when the, the tires are changed and the cars drop back to the ground, it takes off silently on the electric motor. And a bump starts the engine when it gets, when it gets out to the track. Like it, it's, if you look at those technologies, and we're going to race like this. And part of what's happened, our races are going to be the same length. Our, our fuel supply has gone way down. We, we, are, we are allowed to use way less fuel to do a whole race. Uh, the fuel tank in the car, the, the, the fossil fuel tank, not the battery, has been reduced <laughs> in capacity. And no, this is going to be on us to, to make the car finish the race, generating some of its own electricity, storing it, using it, so forth. And we're going to have access to some of the tuning on that, right? So we'll be able to control you know, how much we charge the thing on the straights, how much we charge it. You know, we could, we could do a trickle charge while it's running all the time. We could control how much braking is created by the, by the hybrid motor. It's all super cool. And, and the yes. rear brakes are totally fly by wire, like an F1 car. 
yeah, and why uh, the technology's there? It, it's 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 out there already. Like, why would you go straight to full? I mean, it, fossil fuels aren't going anywhere. I know. It, it, why, why go straight to zero is what I, I what I don't understand. Like, why? You know, so so we get a truck, we get a truck like Joel's, and we make a really efficient hybrid system. On all of a sudden, he's out there getting fifteen. He's not burning a significant amount of fossil fuel. Right. You know what I mean? To, to haul right. what he's hauling. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I mean, okay. So so going to ten or eleven is going to going to keep you know, shall we say, the wolf from the door for a while. Uh, but you know, eventually that's going to seem like a lot. We're going to get used sure. to that before you know it. Uh, it, it is. So uh, it, that's so. Why not? Why not something in between? I, I don't know. I, I mean, know. I, highly on seems to be struggling. I mean, they're there. They've got some investors. They've done some things. They've got a, got trucks out running around. They're not doing that well, uh, you know, fuel mileage wise. But I think that's because of other specs, not so much because of the, their system. Uh, at least the guys I've talked to have driven them. You know, I ran into a guy that did the fuel pumps here. You know, the local little truck stop right down the road. I was fueling like my, my pickup up one day, and I saw one of the Hylion trucks, and I saw the green axle under the back, and I start chatting with the guy. And he didn't know who I was, and then he noticed I was knowledgeable about it. He goes, "Oh yeah, we get like eight. And I'm like, well, "That's not very good." <laughs> I, uh, I uh, he looked at me I, and uh, like, I think he's like eight, eight and a half. And I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's yeah. not good at all." Yeah. So why do, why do, I, I think their problem is is they're not getting the truck right first. Exactly. You know, and, and yeah. yeah. So exactly. You know, you just want to look. I, at I agree. Them when they I, say that, and, and you want to look at them, go uh, eight. I'm sorry. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what i did yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, and then i introduced myself and then he knew who i was after that and it okay. was yeah so it was, yeah. it was it was interesting yeah yeah but but yeah so i don't get why we wouldn't skip over that or why we'd skip over that i, I you know the, the push to electric i get i understand i, I actually even kind of like but yeah there are a lot of questions to be answered and there that's going to build over a much longer time it's going to take much you know, it's going to take a lot longer to improve the grid to the point where it can handle it. And, and you know, again, maybe I'm an optimist, but I believe that with storage uh, technologies and, you know, and, and being able to use sun, solar, you know, uh, tidal, current, whatever you want to make make some electricity, if there's a way to store it, that's great. You know, if there, there are storage cells on the grid that can do it, I, I honestly think that's a solvable problem. I think we can get to the point where we generate enough but not tomorrow. You know what I mean? Right. It's not going to happen next right. week or next year or whatever. I mean, it's, this is, you know, it's going to be, you know, and when my kids my age, you may see some of this stuff. The, the, the problem I see, you know, and, and I, I kind of doubt there's been a much bigger proponent for electric than myself. I've been excited about it for years. People thought I was nuts it, and I still am, but I hate the way we're doing it. And I said that years ago, I, I don't want the government involved in this when there's free money around there will be corruption every single time there will be huge failures when there's that much free money floating around there's almost no accountability all kinds of people will start up companies to get the free money whether it's you know developing these products or whatever and that's going to be the downfall of all this that that alone the government getting involved with big tax incentives and all this stuff will put us at least a decade behind it won't advance this. It's going to put us a decade behind. Yeah, and the market will still take care of it. They, it you know will. I mean, the market it will, will, will yeah. end up. It will. Yeah, taking care of it. Yeah, right. when it makes sense, when it's profitable, when it when it you know when it's logical for flow of transportation to go to electric trucks, they're going to. Right. You know, it's, it's going to happen. But you know, let that happen because it makes sense. Not yeah. I mean, I, I don't mind the little kickstart here or there, but uh, they just go too far. Exactly. You know, it's, yeah, just, it's just too far. They're they're pushing it too hard with all of their you know regulations, and then pushing it even harder by giving incentives. So uh, and and punishing yep. the petroleum industry the way they are, uh, we're just making a mess of this, unfortunately. It, and like I said, I think it's an exciting well, look, case, future. I'm not going to agree with that. Given the petroleum, the petrol, the petro- uh, look at the petroleum industry's profits. They're not be, they're not being punished too hard. I wouldn't. Uh, they they've opportunized on this well, to, to the nth degree. No, I, I'm not. I don't. So that's uh, the the problem yeah. is not that they're being punished in a way financially. You're right. They have. They have plenty of money. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm I'm talking about being punished just by being shut down 
by not being allowed to operate the way they were before. We were completely energy independent as a country, and we shut down that industry. Yeah. We, we told that industry, the, the, the administration told that industry, we are coming after you and we want to put you out of business. To, to me, this is kind of a, a catch-22 with the petroleum industry because you have this this regulation that essentially says you're not going to build a refinery and you're not going to drill here, which they want to do. And if we did, you know, they're going to dominate the marketplace. It'd be very hard for electric to come in. So the government comes in and says, okay, we're going to make this so hard for them to operate. They're not going to be able to expand. Okay. So we got supply and demand working again. They're making money hand over fist because of the limited supply out there and the demand is very high. So, so whose fault is it really? I don't know. You can look at both sides and say both are to blame. You know, you get government regulating the hell out of them. Then it's limiting their, their ability to produce. And it just, it gets crazy. There's so many scenarios there. But it, it, but I mean, their, own, yeah. their, their, their only responsibility is to their shareholders, though. And if they're absolutely going up every quarter, that's it. So no matter what regulation is thrown at them, they're, they're, they're going to take it from us, you know, they're, exactly. they're consumers. Right. We, so. we, we yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, it, it, I, I agree with that. There's it, no doubt about that. It's no different than this new bill that they're about to pass, which I just can't believe we're going to spend more money, but they're going to. They're going to pass it. Um, it. It's the same thing. That's going to drive cost up, not down. They, they are now we're just going to tax corporations is what they're saying. And no, we're not going to tax people under 400,000, which is, it is wrong. It's a lie, but they are telling us, Oh, but we're just going to tax the corporations and people don't understand you're taxing us. Corporations don't pay tax. They pass <laughs> pay it on in the price that's of their exactly product. Right. And, uh, that's and exactly right. It has to go up because this tax is applied to every player in the industry. So it's not like anybody can say, well, we won't raise our price. You have to raise your prices to stay competitive. You know, business in it is competitive already. And if the government's going to tax you heavier, you're just going to pass it along to the consumers. Yeah, and the problem with that kind of tax is the regressive tax. You know what I mean? It hits the people hardest that cannot aff- that cannot afford it. And that, oh, yeah. that's what I don't like about right. that. It, it really yeah. and you know and and people for whatever reason a lot of people don't see that. You know they think oh we're getting that big evil corporation. <laughs> Not really. I mean it's, it's it's coming right back to you. So uh, you got to be very careful when you do that that kind of stuff. I know it's it's popular with a lot of folks to be up on corporations but ultimately in the end if you buy anything you're going to end up paying that tax that, let, that is what's going to happen let, let's think about this realistically we could as outrageous as this sounds we could tax the rich people 90 percent crazy numbers which happened once in history in this country by the way but we could tax them at 90 percent and you know what we wouldn't change their lifestyle They would still live the way they do right now. They wouldn't be hurting. They wouldn't have to worry about whether they're going to be able to make their mortgage payment next month. That would be taxing them 90%. But you put this 15% tax on the corporation and you hurt the poorest people in the country. You will change their lifestyle in a really bad way. Right. Yep. Absolutely. (sighs) That was quite a rant. Maybe we should take a call. <laughs> it was. It was good. <laughs> let, let, Might need to after that. Yeah, let, let's, uh, let's take a call. Ron's been very patient in South Carolina. Ron, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for t- taking my call. I, uh, I truly enjoy listening to your show. Um, so I've got – a 2006 Volvo that I bought brand new and thanks to you Kevin I've been driving this thing since then and I've got 940,000 miles on it Um, of course I run household goods so I only average about 60,000 miles a year Okay, but I'm actually purchasing a new Peterbilt um, having a big bunk put on it and uh, was really didn't have a lot of options as far as 
checking it out. I'm looking for some advice from Joel just to uh, and pick this truck up Monday. But, um, of course, it's going to be, you know, listening to you guys over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's not really, I want to make sure that I'm, I don't know, driving it correctly. If there is a, if there is a choice, because I'm going from a 13 speed with a 500 SX Cummings in it to a 565 ISX or X15, excuse me, with an Eaton Ultra Shift Plus in it. So I don't know that I really have to drive the thing, but what do you, what do you guys have any uh, thoughts on that or anything I should be aware of? You have a very, very traditional drivetrain going on here. This this truck is not downsped by any stretch of the imagination. It has older transmission technology in it. Um, so you just you just need to be aware of that. That this is not what Henry Albert has, what Jamie Hagen has, what what I'm running. It's probably going to be nowhere near that efficiency range. So. Essentially, how you drove, what was the powertrain in your other truck that you had? Uh, ISX 500. Okay, so it's, it's, it's going to be... It's going to be very, very similar. Yeah, very, very similar power range. Um, you know, there's not going to be any real benefit to dropping that engine down super low in the RPM range. It's not going to like it, and the, the durability will be questionable. Um, so I, I guess you, you're pretty much just going to keep on doing what you're doing, and, and uh, you should be just fine at it, this this truck is what it is. It, it is not going to set the world on fire in terms of fuel efficiency. It'll be better than what you had, but it is not going to be in the elite group of trucks for fuel efficiency. And as long as you're not expecting that, I, I think you'll be just fine with it. I think your durability will be just fine. Um, as long as your cruising average RPM isn't north of 1350 you shouldn't have a lot of emission system problems if if it is north of 1350 cruising down the highway you may want to budget a little extra for emission system maintenance get real aggressive on it and uh you know this this is a time where you know and and i wouldn't tell very many people to do this but this would be the time where i would dump some catalyst in a truck if i had a if i had a uh an emission system with uh with a, you know, your average cruise speed was up over 1,350 RPM, you know, you might want to look at something like that and just, just get really aggressive on your maintenance if that's the case. Okay. Well, being a, you know, I've never driven automatic um, like this before, so will that, do I need to be aware of it? Just leave it in, let it do what it wants to do? I, I, like, you know, I, 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 how does that work? Here's what I can tell you with the Volvo and the Detroit. They have done a stupendous job with their shift logics matching the the power curve, and they're spot on. Um, with the older Eaton Fuller products, because they never really knew what engine that was going to go behind, they their logics tend to lack a little bit, but I don't think there's much you can do about that. So, um, again, I think you're going to, kind of be stuck with something that's a little less than optimal, but is acceptable. Um, you will, you'll probably be happy with it. I mean, I'll probably be pulling my freaking hair out with the damn thing, but, uh, <laughs> most drivers, you know, they're not, scru- they're not scrutinizing it to the degree that I would scrutinize it. So I, I would say you're going to have a, a dependable truck. That's going to get probably a little bit better than average fuel efficiency. It's, it's not going to set the world on fire, but you'll probably still make some money with it. And, and, uh, the truck will probably run just fine for you. Well, in our, in our world, you know, I, I uh, labor costs is three times what my fuel cost. So, uh, hey, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Not not a, not a deal to me, right? Uh, but you know, being with the extended sleeper, they you know they bumped this thing up to the five sixty five. It was already kind of specked out um, before I ordered it. So, um, okay. Well, like I said, I was just kind of curious about the uh, the transmission and, and your thoughts on it. So, I uh, what, do enjoy what I uh, you guys show. So. What would be cool if you could call back and give us an update once you get this thing and run it a little bit and, get, and give us your thoughts on that because that's just a, you know, that's a combination that I don't play with much at all and I don't know a lot of people that 
that run that type of combination that are actually concerned with the fuel efficiency at all. Most people that buy that, they're just like, I don't care, you know, and yeah. so they don't pay attention to anything. So it, it would be nice to get some feedback on something like that. So, so well, that's, I do, all that's, that's I track a, mine very uh, well. Good. So I, I actually, I do track mine really well. I have a really cool app on my phone for tracking fuel mileage and, and maintenance costs. But, um, you know, being in, in, in our industry, you know, I've been in this for 30 something years now. I'm just looking for some more creature comforts of home. So, sure. A, sure. So, hey, yeah, Ron, make, make hey, sense. Fun. I can't, hey, I can't Ron, imagine hey, getting good fuel mileage out of something like that. Yes, hey, sir. Hey, hey, Ron, if you're going to tell people that you have a really cool app, it better be fuel gauges or I'm hanging up on you. <laughs> so whether it's fuel gauges well, or not, tell them it's fuel gauges. <laughs> well, I, 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 I told I told so much to my wife. She thinks we're having an affair, so that's okay, brother. So it's all. <laughs> hey, so all the, all that everything Joel said, yes. Um, that 565 IFX was one of my favorite engines. That thing, anytime we put one on the dyno stock, it made way more horsepower than it was supposed to. They run really well. That, that CPL is a good, that's a good piece. Leave it alone. And like Joel said, just keep the revs as low as possible so you're not pumping so much through the, uh, through the after treatment system. Okay. Well, when, one last question. When you say, you know, beef up my maintenance on, uh, after treatment, the uh, emission system, what do you, what do you really mean? So what, what I like to do on mine is, um, and you're not running that many miles, so you're running 60,000 miles a year. I would run the overhead on that every single year, regardless of the miles. I would just do it. I'd be pulling the boost sensor out of it and replacing it every single year as well. You know, with these newer engines, there's not a whole hell of a lot that you really need to be doing. Um, depending on where your average cruise speed is, you know, you may want to look at something um, like, like a catalyst or like a hot shot secret. Um, if you're, let's say you're cruising down the highway and you're at 1100, I don't even know that you got to worry about that. I, I think you'll be, you'll be just fine. Um, so yeah, just, just keep the overhead run on the damn thing. Super important. Um, keep the revs as low as you comfortably can with that engine. It's not going to run down at 900. Like mine goes down the road. Um, 1100 is probably going to be the basement for that. Wouldn't you think John? Oh Yeah. Yeah, ten fifty, yeah. eleven hundred. Uh, don't go below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I, I think you'll be, I think you'll be happy with it for what you're doing. It sounds like it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Okay. Well, listen, I really appreciate it, guys. Y'all have a great day. All right. Thanks for the call. Hey, guys. I, uh, I, me too. I, I was just looking at that article that I talked about, the $40,000 incentives for the electric trucks. And I know that when they put pictures in these articles, the people putting the pictures in usually don't know what the hell they're doing. But um, I, I find it interesting, <laughs> the Nikola truck that they're showing in this article is a cab over, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And it's a single mm -hmm. axle. I, I probably have to believe this yes. is their European truck. I, I don't. We're not going to see this one. Yeah, in we're not going to see a single axle cab over, are we? Oh, oh they're here. It's a, it's a Tal design or a Tal sys. I forget which company it is. It's Italian. It's uh, it's it, it, they literally just bought it from them. They didn't do their they they shit can their own. I think, and they they have that, and they've actually got them here. Do they really? Okay, are they single yeah, I've axle? Seen, I've seen a couple of. I've seen yeah, a couple of dealerships that have that have both single and, and tandems um, that they're yeah they're putting together these really creative rental deals and you know because they're they are expensive I, they were just crazy expensive what three three hundred three ten something like that for yeah. one what, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When, yep. when yep. the Nikola and then you got you got to buy charger out. and all that they, stuff yeah. Yeah. when the Nikola first came out I think it was like five hundred I mean their price was insane when it first came out. So actually, wait a second. I thought they yeah. were giving them away, weren't they? What was what, what was that deal? Remember the deal when they first came out? Oh, no, they, they did have that kind of rental lease program where you just paid so much per mile yeah. or something, right? Yeah, I do remember that. Uh, boy, that's interesting. I wonder what they're what they plan on doing with a bunch of single axles. There just aren't that many opportunities to use them. 
No, well, it's it, you know, it's for the like the beverage distribution that's running the little the yeah. little trailers that are going around to the bars and and dropping stuff like that's what yeah that's for yeah, yeah. got yep. it that seems to be their market right now yeah all right let's uh, let's grab another call we've got uh, Matt on the line Matt welcome good morning gentlemen hey, I got a oddball question here and uh, through some of your guys' research maybe uh, know something. All the different coolant hoses, the silicone. I got a million miles, so I'm going to replace everything this fall, flush the system and go new. Is there any reason I couldn't use the just regular plumbing, the PEX pipe? I mean, I'll still use some silicone hoses for connections, for vibration and all that in different spots, but... As long as you know, nothing's we, rubbing, we, that should be a lifeline. Yeah, we got away from silicone hoses in the cooling system and actually just run the regular gates. And I think Volvo in general did just because you get some, what do they call it, osmosis or something through the silicone. And you can actually be having to add uh, antifreeze when you run silicone hoses. It doesn't happen with every truck, but I've seen that where you constantly adding coolant, you're looking for a problem, and it ends up being the damn hoses. So um, yeah, you don't have right to be married to those. Yeah, right, right. If they've worked for you in the past and you're happy with them, by all means. Um, yeah, as far as what do you want to basically hard plummet except where you can't? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, and... I mean, I'm thinking even like insulating some of the lines because I'm going to run a fuel heater, different things, and that's all thermostatically controlled. So I'm not heating the fuel all the time, just just on the sub-zero days. Man, oh man, I don't know. Um, you may may be overthinking this a little bit. <laughs> it seems like yeah, a lot of yeah, work for, for, for very little. Yeah, <laughs> for very little benefit. I I, I don't know, yeah. John. What do you think? <laughs> Uh, I mean, if, if if it's easy, if there's a, that company that makes all those stainless pipes, uh, I know they make some kits for a lot of trucks, and they make a nice product and just use rubber hose to connect them. Uh, aside from that, I wouldn't go crazy on my own making things and spending that kind of investment time on it. And, you know, I don't know how, if trucks already got, what, a million miles or so on it, then, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know if that, that, that's, I don't know if it's worth the effort. I really don't. I mean, if, uh, that's, I forget, the, what's the name of that company that makes those stainless pipes, Kevin? Do you know them? I don't. Uh-uh. They make replace stainless replacements for pretty much every tube under the hood of most trucks. I, I cannot remember their name. If you do a Google search, maybe they'll find them. Um, I, I would not be opposed to putting all their stuff on and then just connecting it with good old rubber hose. You'd be fine. Okay. Well, that's all I had. And since you want to get it early today, Kevin, I'll I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we're we're two minutes past already. So. <laughs> We've already gone beyond that. That's right. All right, we'll we'll cut you loose. Uh, yeah, I kind of like this flexible timing thing on the show. No breaks. Start when we want. Stop when we want. Um, anybody have anything earth shed? Oh, I have something. I have something. Um, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Um, charcoal gray? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. I, okay. I, I own four vehicles that are charcoal gray. I think my psychologist would have something to say about that. Everything I own no. is gray, black, or blue. I don't know how that happened, but it is. <laughs> no, here, here's, here's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm wondering about what color okay. suit I should wear when I accept the Nobel Prize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, I, I have I have three or four gray suits as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. And one good. dark blue one. I, I, <laughs> Kevin, if you're gonna get the, if you're gonna accept the Nobel Prize, I think you ought to wear crude oil black. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I talked about this a little on Wednesday. Um, I think I finally kind of broke the whole code here on the stress thing. I'm kind of excited about this stress ah. thing. I think that we've just always looked at stress completely wrong, just like about everything else we've done in health. Um, sure. <laughs> the the the. Uh, the Garmin watch now has a new reading, although we're not getting it on everybody's watch. And I was supposed to call Garmin yesterday, but I've got too much going on. So it's going to have to wait till next week. Um, I wanted to call Garmin and find out 
why some people are seeing this and some aren't. Um, Garmin now gives us the raw HRV score, which I really like. I used to wear my aura ring to get that score. Um, Garmin has always used the HRV reading for body battery and stress and sleep, but now we still have all those. Now we get the raw score. And, and here's what I'm finding. We don't, we always kind of think of stress as being mental, right? It's not like a physical mm-hmm. thing. It's, it's, it's in our head. It's that we, we, we are stressed out and that is true. But what I have found is that I I've talked about this stress muscle that we have to build our stress muscle so that we're more resilient and our approach to stress. One of the things I realized if I had to recommend a book for somebody about stress, I can't think of a single book out there. Nothing that tells you anything, you know, on, on how to make it better. We all talk about stress. Nobody ever says what you're supposed to do about it. You know, I've always said, well, I guess you got to go meditate and be mindful. Well, it turns out that doesn't even work. Um, the supplements that are supposed to help, they don't work. I'm like, what, what are we missing here? Why, why do we have this so wrong? Well, it turns out HRV, what it's measuring is what mode your body is in, fight or flight, which is stress. That's what stress is. It's the fight or flight mode, nothing more. Or are you in the rest and digest mode? And that's HRV measures that. The higher our HRV number is, the more time we're spending in rest and digest. The lower it is, the more time we're spending in fight or flight. And the only way to improve this is to improve your physical fitness. It has not, almost nothing to do with your mind. The, wow. We have become so weak physically. Most people's HRV score is really low. And when you compare it to somebody who's fit, physically fit, their HRV score is high. And when your HRV score is high, it's high because... Do we think that people with a high HRV score live some sort of different life where they don't have all that stress? Of course not. So how are they keeping that score? Well, they're, they're keeping that score high because they've built their physical fitness and now their body can handle that same situation without going into the fight or flight mode. We're so weak physically you know, that everything uh, 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 triggers our stress response. Kevin, mm-hmm. this is uh, something that you probably can relate to, and you're talking about this, and this is just kind of clicking in my mind, and you tell me if I'm crazy or not, but, you know, when you're working out all the time, and, you know, I used to be in the gym just constantly, and I was back in for a little while again, but, you know, at, at one point, I was bench pressing 450 pounds. I was I was in, in pretty good shape, and, uh, you know, you just have an attitude when you're in that shape that nothing bothers you, you know, you, you, you just, you just do. I mean, you kind of walk, you kind of strut, you know, it's just, it's kind of the thing and, and it, stuff just does not bother you. So I a hundred percent get what you're saying here. That, that is a fact when you are in shape and you're strong and, and especially when you know it and you feel good about it, shit just doesn't bother you. You it are just exactly doesn't. right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. And, and yeah, and I, I always thought, you know, okay, it's a chemical thing in your brain, you know, but uh, wh- whatever's causing it, it is absolutely for real. And uh, I, I know the feeling well, I absolutely. So when you look at the so, protocol you know, I'm, put together I'm more of a, for this, everything about the protocol pushes our body to extremes that we don't experience anymore we used to cold exposure hot exposure the resistance training the breathing they're all doing the same thing they're pushing our physical body to places where we don't push it anymore and that's why we get so weak people freak out over the cold shower experience I, I get it. I freak out over it. It sucks in the beginning. Once you get used to it, though, it's no big deal anymore. That cold water doesn't put my body into, you know, total stress mode now. But we have just become right. physically weak, and nobody's talking about that. I never hear that mentioned when they You're- everybody talks about stress, but nobody's telling us what to do. Your perfect test for this would be... Uh- 
go to Virginia Beach or where they do it on the West Coast to the, the Navy training or the Navy SEAL training camp where they expose them to stuff exactly yeah. like you're talking. You know, they get them up at four in the morning and go yeah. plump their ass out in the surf and it's 32 <laughs> degrees out and, you know, stuff like that. But no, you know, in fact, it's just the opposite especially for, for men. Um, you know, if, if you're a manly man anymore, it's kind of like you're a terrible person. Uh, you, you know, it's, yeah, yes, yes, that's, that's exactly right. So, um, I, I get where you're coming from and, and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm buying into this theory 100%. I, I like what I'm hearing because I've always always kind of felt that but never expressed it the way that you did. I, man, when I was in the gym, I always was like, you just felt so damn good, and, and you, you really didn't. You didn't give a damn about nothing right. phased you. You just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the only thing Absolutely. that changed is now, big and, you know, you guys will appreciate this because we're all kind of data nerds. The only thing that's changed is we're now able to measure it. That is awesome. That is cool. <laughs> that is really, really cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it changes everything, doesn't it, it having it, that data? It, it did. It, I've been reading, thinking about this for a long time, trying to figure it out. We got it all wrong. Now that we have the data, I look at it and go, hey, wait a minute, this is pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty so awesome. I, again, it's the same. I don't, I don't do the weight training or the heavy stuff that you guys do. I'm more of a, I'm more of a cardio fag. So, but it's the same thing. I, I'm fit. I'm trimmed. I feel good. Uh, my, my resistance to stress is high. It's just, uh, you know, and when I do that, you know, and I, I feel, you know, really strong. Um, I, I push myself pretty hard on the bike. Like I, I don't just go out for leisurely rides. I, I get on the trail and I ride as fast as I can for the whole thing. And that might be 30 miles per hour. That might be 15 miles per hour, depending on the part of the trip. Or I'll park my heart rate at a certain number, you know, that's up there, you know, 165, 170 or something. And I have little lights on my dash that tell me where it is while I'm riding. And I I just keep it there. I'm like, all right, I'm going to ride hard enough to keep my heart rate right here for an hour. And, you know, we're going to see what that does. And, uh, or I'll prescribe a certain amount of burn into my leg and just keep it there. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's amazing what it does, you know, to me mentally as well. I think maybe that's it. Maybe that, maybe that's the correlation. Maybe, maybe I'm not just, you know, burning off steam or whatever. I mean, there's, there's probably more to it than the simple uh, act of just going out and doing something active to take your mind off of things. I, I, I really, yeah, think I, there I is. always had the John, remember, you know, yeah, I always had the problem. You've told the story and I think it was when you came back to Pittsburgh power and you're working a lot of hours and you started gaining weight and remember how bad you felt. Yeah. And things do stress you out more. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it's like this downward spiral. It, like it's it's a, you know it's synergistic, it, you know negative synergy. I mean, it's like you know okay, yeah, I'm, I'm eating poorly. I'm not exercising, and I got angry truck drivers on the phone. <laughs> like it's <laughs> oh shoot, that was funny. Yeah. Yeah. So I, when 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 I was in the, when I was in the gym, Kevin, and you can tell me how this relates to what you're what you're thinking here. But my problem always was okay, and when you look at my my body shape. I was never built like a power lifter or a weight lifter, really small wrist and yeah. didn't have really broad shoulders and whatnot. Right. And I lifted with a guy who was just an animal, you know, and I was always like, man, how do you do that? And he's like, it's all, it's all in your mind. It's all in your mind. You got to concentrate, think it's more in your mind about lifting weight. And so I got up to this point where I was benching these crazy, stupid numbers and I was always screwing myself up. I'd hurt my shoulder. I'd hurt my wrist because it Ooh. was just really too Ooh. much weight for how I was built and i would do that i once i learned how to overcome the mental barrier i'd go in there and screw myself up every time and i knew i was doing it but i couldn't stop i was like what the hell so i'm I'm thinking there's something to this man you you would go in there and you would swear to god i'm not going over 300 on my bench today i'm not next thing you know they're piling on 450 and the bars bending and it's just nothing you, you couldn't wait to do it that was the stupid part. You knew you were going to screw yourself up, but you couldn't wait to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Your mind gets, you, you get so confident because you feel so strong, like you can take on the world. But you, you mentioned that the guy you worked out with was kind of a beast. You know, anybody that mm-hmm. can bench 450, I would put in that class too. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. Holy yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, That's it was it. it was nuts. I mean, we he he would just harp on me, mind over so, over the weight, you know. And and I worked on it because I was stuck at like two fifty for like five years and just could not get over it. And then I started yeah. working out with that guy, and and he taught me all this mental stuff, you know, to think about. And yeah, it sure worked. It, nothing changed besides my attitude. So and then after my my weight started to go up, that's when you get that feeling of invincibility, and and nothing okay. phases you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm the same. I have very small joints, small bones, really small wrists. Um, so I dealt with those things. Have you read the book by the guy that um, invented the X3 bar, Dr. Jayquish? No, I have not. He wrote a book I called Weightlifting is a Waste of Time and So is Cardio. And he explains what he means by that and how he developed the X3 sure. bar. But the here's the, the simple explanation of why when you start getting up to those weights, you're going to hurt yourself in the bench press yeah, you do. In, in almost every lift. When we think about it, our, our most critical time on bench press is when the bar is touching your chest. It's when you're the weakest and it's when you're putting mm-hmm. the most stress on the, all of your joints. The shoulders are almost hyperextended. Your wrists are in a vulnerable spot. And you have to move that weight. You also have to overcome inertia. What's that thing we talk about with uh, – there was a concept here. in the Four moment. Moment of inertia. Moment of inertia. <laughs> same, moment of inertia there. Right. There you same, go. Same, same thing. Moment of inertia, that, yeah. w- that weight is coming down. Then we stop it on our chest. Now we have to get that thing moving again, and it's the it's where we need the most force, and we're in the worst position to apply that force. We're weakest right then when we need it the most. That's why the bands. So once they got the band yeah. built properly, bands have been around forever, and they sucked. I, I hated him. Once he got the idea of this band right, now when you're down at your chest. It's the weakest point of the band, which is the way we want it. Now you can go up to this crazy Mm -hmm. high amount of resistance because you're not going to have the resistance anymore at the weakest point. You have the least amount of resistance there. This is why the bands I Mm -hmm. sold, these are far better than free weights for that reason alone. The squat, I can now, Uh, when I squat with bands... I go as deep mm-hmm. as I am physically capable of going on my squat. Uh, there you go. Because I can, because yeah. when I yeah, get I way did. down into that deep squat, the band is almost slack. You know, talking about being in, in the weakest part of the movement and stuff with free weights, there would be times where we would we would jump off the free weights and we would go to the machines for like a month straight. And then you'd come back to the free weights. You ever do that and how funky it is when you're, yes. you're bringing shit down, you want to tip over and nothing balances yeah. and you're like, wow. So yeah, yeah the, the band would be interesting. I, I, you know, I had tried bands in the past and I never liked them. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll give that another shot. You know, I know you've talked about the, the X3 for quite a while. And actually one of the engineers that I work with at Volvo, he loves his, he's got that X3 and he is, absolutely loves it so he's been harping on me to get one so here's the interesting pull the trigger on it and get one here's the interesting thing i've found is that the more weightlifting experience somebody has the more they like the x3 yeah it's especially probably in my case because like i said every single time i'd go in there i'd screw myself up and right. and knew i was doing it and with the bands you're going to take that possibility away from yourself even even if you want to be stupid it sounds like so yeah. um that, that'd be interesting i'll, I'll so, snag one of those things and, and try it out yeah i think i'm gonna buy one too you have so, those on your store don't you yeah we do and we also, it won't matter for you guys. Yeah, you, guys are both, you guys are both tall enough that the bands that come with it work. They're 40 inch bands. And for me, for a couple movements, they're just too long. Um, but we found another company gotcha. that makes the bands same way. The construction is the same. They feel the same, but they make a bunch of different sizes. So I was able, we brought uh, 32 mm-hmm. inch bands into the store. So anybody who's like shorter than say five, nine or so will probably find they like the short bands better. If you're taller than 5'9", the other bands work good. Here's what I'm thinking about doing, though. I'm excited about this whole stress idea. Um, I'm thinking about putting together like a 30-day 
challenge because the other thing I've done with the workout is I've broken up the workout now in a way that if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, you could work out every single day without overtraining. Yeah, that, that would be me. If I get into it, that's the stupid shit I do. You know, you can, you can never take a break. You got to, you got to go, got to go, got to go, got to go. Yeah. 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 That, that would be me. So this, this sounds like it's right up my alley because it, this is weightlifting for stupid people right here. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Wait, there, there's the title for my book, weightlifting for dummies. Yeah. Well, that, there you go. That made, that makes it already. I, 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 I should be, I, was already out I should be, I, I should be the poster boy for your weightlifting book. <laughs> so here, here's what I'm thinking about doing. I want to get some people together and I want to do a 30 day challenge where we all do it. We're not going to skip a day for 30 days. We're going to just commit to doing this. Now, once you get through that 30 days, you're going to see incredible results. Uh, and then you can kind of ease off a little bit if you want. Joel, you won't. You'll still be a fanatic. But um, I, I, I think I, I really want to get some people together and do this challenge and really prove. I've seen the results, and it, I think it's pretty incredible. So will my heart valve screw the works up on this? No. Nope. Okay, just, just, just making sure. I didn't know nope. if that would... No, throw anything I, off or not. So, no, I don't think right. so. Especially now, you know, you've kind of had it repaired. So I think it's, it's um, definitely better now, but I don't think that would, would be an issue at all. In fact, I think that this, okay. this idea that we're talking about is really good because it, you know, anytime we talk about the heart or the cardiovascular system, that's where we're worried about stress. You know, we know that sure. if you're stressed, you're going to gain weight. You're going to do all kinds of other crazy things. We also worry about the heart. So, yeah, I think any mm -hmm. time we could strengthen your response to stress, that would be good for your condition. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Right, yeah, sure. I, I'm definitely, definitely interested in it. I'll check it all out and maybe I'll get myself one ordered and all right. Get sounds here. good. All right. We're going to wrap this up. I got to get out of here. I got a lot to do. We got to head north. Uh, so I will probably be doing the show Monday from, I don't know, might be on the islands. Uh, we'll be up there somewhere. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. I'm going to go wander around for a while. Uh, we will see you back here on Monday. Everybody have a great weekend. All right. Be safe. Be profitable, be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.